Okay, your position looks good, Joe. Let's go Dallas Ion. Haven't gotten to one minute warning yet. One minute. Dallas Ion. Push the test. Your position is good, Joe. Pump idle. Good pump. Good igniter. Ready to launch now. Good light. Okay. This is the X-15 research aircraft designed to investigate the problems of manned flight in a near space environment. Altitudes up to 50 miles, speeds up to Mach 6. High speed aerodynamics, aerodynamic heating, structural design, aircraft stability, and control in space and re-entry. This was the kind of information it was to provide, and provided it did. Here's the story. Before the X-15, the question had been, what is to be man's role in space travel? Can he pilot an aircraft out of the Earth's atmosphere, fly it in space, then re-enter the atmosphere and bring it back to a safe landing on Earth? There were many unknowns to be discovered, many problems to be overcome before the answer would be known. That today's test flight is almost routine is a tribute to the comprehensive program that has moved step by step to prove that man can pilot an aircraft into space and return. Give us a 20,000 foot check, Joe. Coming up on 20,000 now. Okay, I know you've done it, but check your flaps and circuit breakers. Roger, done it. Ready to go pressurize? Pressurize. You're in good shape. Good flight, Joe. This is your happy controller going off the air. There have been many men who have helped make the X-15 project a success. One of them is aircraft research engineer Hartley Soule, who was originally in charge of designing and building the X-15 aircraft. Of course, I'm retired now, and the X-15, she's not the queen of the hangar anymore, although she's still hard at work. But I remember years ago, you know, it was long before Sputnik that we decided to build the X-15. This airplane, the first hypersonic aircraft, was going to be our first manned space probe. This was a logical step in the research aircraft program that had begun even before the end of World War II. From the beginning, the research aircraft program was a cooperative affair. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, predecessor to NASA, the aircraft industry, the Air Force, the Navy, working together. Their first effort was directed at breaking the sound barrier. And the aircraft that would do it was the X-1, designed to acquire flight data at the speed of sound. On October 14, 1947, with Air Force Captain Charles E. Yeager at the controls, the X-1 made the world's first supersonic flight. 
Other research aircraft soon followed the X-1. The Douglas D-558 Phase 1 to investigate flight with a straight wing at high subsonic speeds. The Northrop X-4, designed to fly without a tail. The Douglas D-558 Phase 2 to study flight characteristics of swept wing aircraft at transonic and supersonic speeds. The Bell X-5, designed with variable sweep. And the Douglas X-3, to investigate thin straight wings at speeds beyond Mach 1. The Bell X-1A, with its increased performance, first of a series of follow-on aircraft to the original X-1. The X-2, another Bell airplane designed to explore aircraft behavior at altitudes above 100,000 feet and Mach 3 speeds. The X-1E and X-1B, both later follow-ons to the X-1. Step by step, these different aircraft helped nibble away at the unknown, until by 1956, the frontiers of manned flight had been advanced from speeds of 500 miles an hour to Mach 3, and from altitudes of only 40,000 to more than 100,000 feet. Speed, altitude, sure we kept going higher and faster than we'd ever been before. Only because that's where new information, where the unknown has always been found in flight, above and beyond the limits you've already reached. As early as 1952, the X-15 aircraft was being conceived by the people at NACA. At the Langley Center in Virginia, they began investigating the unknowns associated with flight to the thinnest edges of the Earth's atmosphere. One unknown concerned aerodynamic heating. The X-15 would be the first aircraft to push from supersonic to hypersonic speeds, where the flow of air would heat the leading edges of the plane to 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Experiment after experiment was run to see if this extreme temperature would weaken or melt basic materials. The data resulting from tests run well beyond temperatures expected for the X-15 proved that there were materials that would withstand this kind of heat. Another problem, after rocket engines shut down, the X-15 would be thrust into a ballistic arc in air so thin that normal aerodynamic control would be impossible. How then could the pilot control the aircraft? The answer? Reaction controls that would allow him to correct roll movement and position the aircraft properly for re-entry through the atmosphere. But the designers knew the problems of control would never be fully solved until an X-15 aircraft was actually built. We knew the X-15 would look something like this. We knew that it would be a manned aircraft that would fly more than 4,000 miles an hour and as high as 250,000 feet. We knew that like the X-1, the X-15 would be air launched and propelled in its flight by a rocket motor, the most powerful engine ever installed in an airplane. Of course, we didn't know what kind of a rocket motor that would prove to be. There'd never been anything like it. Designed for a manned system, the 50,000 pounds of thrust in its single chamber had to be controllable at the pilot's discretion. He had to be able to throttle this engine in flight. This is Harry Cook, program manager for the X-15 rocket engine. The LR-99 rocket engine was designed and built for the X-15 by the Reaction Motors Division of the Thiokol Chemical Corporation. We had had some experience in this field. Reaction motors had built power plants for all of the X-1s and for the D-558 Phase II aircraft. But those rocket engines we had made for earlier research planes were primitive forerunners of the engine we built for the X-15. 57,000 pounds of thrust with a throttle attached. No engine like this had ever existed before, but Thiokol built one for the X-15. Now, 
What kind of airframe could be designed to carry such an engine? The X-15 was designed and built to take the stresses encountered at hypersonic speeds, to go to extreme high altitude and to beat the heat, survive the extreme high temperatures that build up on the wing, fuselage and tail during the re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere. The engineering research contribution we made at North American Aviation to the X-15 project was to take NASA's proposal to build this aircraft and to find out how they could be met. Harrison Storms. He was in charge of the X-15 program at North American Aviation. For example, they proposed to use a new nickel alloy metal for the protective sheath or skin on all three of the airframes of the X-15. We had to find out how it could be used. Inconel X was the name of the new nickel alloy. It was developed to withstand the searing temperatures at hypersonic speeds. Temperatures of 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit or more. But to use Inc. and LX, it had to be cross-welded, and no one had been able to do it before. A major milestone was passed when North American discovered how it could be done. North American also originated the idea of fairings along each side of the X-15 fuselage to house control cables and hydraulic lines. This left the entire fuselage volume for power plant plumbing, as well as fuel and propellant tanks. Another invaluable North American contribution was the X-15 flight simulator, permitting pilots and ground controllers to plan and practice flights without ever leaving the ground. From an exact replica of the X-15 cockpit, the pilot could actuate hydraulic and control systems identical to those on the aircraft itself. All this was tied into an analog computer that could program actual X-15 missions and simulate every conceivable in-flight problem the pilot might expect to face. Practice in the flight simulator was just one phase of pre-flight preparation. Another took place in the centrifuge at the Navy's Air Development Test Center at Johnsville, Pennsylvania. There, pilots learned how to take the heavy G forces they would meet when they flew the X-15 up into space and back down again. Hours of training here, added to hours in the simulator, extended the pre-flight pilot training period into weeks and even months. Then came the dramatic moment. The X-15 and its B-52 launch aircraft were ready. North American test pilot Scott Crossfield was ready. Step by step, the X-15 research project had moved to this important event. Now, the first of three X-15s was about to begin a series of test flights. The schedule called for an orderly progression of tests. In the first flights, the X-15 would remain attached to the B-52. Then a glide flight would be tried. Only then would powered flight be attempted. This careful program of flight tests, flown by pilot Scott Crossfield, proved the X-15 would do just what its designers hoped she would. From March 10, 1959 until late 1960, when we delivered the third aircraft to the Air Force, I made 14 captive flights, one glide flight, 